Hooray, everyone on Zoom can hear me. And I know this is very, very cheesy, but could you give everyone on Zoom a big whoop and round of applause to welcome them because so they feel more part of tonight. Thank you so much for indulging me. Um, and if you don't know who I am, I'm Becky and I volunteer as the events curator at St Bride. It's just really fantastic to have lots of people here today. I've been chatting to a few people who haven't been here for ages since the pandemic, so it's just really fantastic to have lots of people here today and with us online on Zoom as well. I would just like to say a big thank you to Google and to the Wink in the Word Society Charitable Trust for their generosity in sponsoring this lecture. As we are streaming this event, please do bear with us if we have any technical difficulties with the lecture. If this does happen, we will try to rectify this as soon as possible. For anyone on Zoom, if you're having ex technical difficulties your end, basically the good old thing of calling the IT crowd and they'll probably say to you, turn your computer on and off again, that does normally do the trick. Um, if you are having continued difficulties at your end, then we are recording the lecture, so we will send the link to everyone who has bought a ticket in person or online to watch this again if they'd like to or catch up if they haven't been able to make it tonight. So don't worry, you will get to watch it in some way. Um, please can our Zoom attendees just make sure they're all muted. And for our in-person guests, if you can make sure you've turned your phones on silent. We don't mind you taking photographs, but please just don't use a flash because it really interrupts and disrupts the speaker. I've got a note saying fire alarm, fire alarm spiel, which basically for anyone who's been here a million times will know this by heart. But if you have, if there is a fire, we, I'm seeing Elena laughing in the corner, sorry, it's distracting me. Um, sorry, if there is a fire, we, it will be one continuous alarm bell and the meeting point is through reception and into the courtyard there. If the fire happens to be in reception and you can't get out that way, we'll direct you down the stairs, out onto the street and meet up back round there. So hopefully you're now prepared if the worst happens. Um, if you're at home, I'm assuming you have your own, you know, protocol in place. So, um, of course, you've come along to this talk. Clearly you like coming to talks. You might want to come to more talks in the future. We've got some really fantastic things coming up, up from now until June before we break for the summer. On the 25th of May, we've got a talk called Making Impressions, and it's basically celebrating the printing museums of Great Britain and Ireland. We've basically reached out to as many as we could, and four, four um, or five museums are coming over to chat to us. We've got people from Dublin, Oxford, St Bride, Cambridge, lots of different people. So it'll be a really, really fantastic evening if that's your thing. And if not, come along, you might learn something new. On the 6th of June, we have the next Iron Magazine Type Tuesday event, which will be a book design special, and it's being hosted by Jack Smith and Nico Taylor, who are absolutely fantastic speakers. It will be really interesting and really fun and interactive, so I cannot recommend that highly enough. And we also have our St. Bride Ways Goose happening on Sunday, the 21st of May. And if you don't know what a Ways Goose is, go and Google it, because I'm, I have only got a small amount of time to do my introduction, which you're probably getting bored with by now. But basically, it's a fantastic day. There'll be cake, there'll be lots of people selling stuff, lots of letterpress goodness. So do come along for that if you can. It's free to enter and it'll just be a really lovely day. And for all, more details of all of that, you can find out more on our website. And if you didn't know, by coming to this lecture, your help, your, the money from ticket sales goes to help the library at the St. Bride Foundation running for current and future generations to enjoy. So just by coming along here, you're, you're basically helping a brilliant place keep going. So if you've not been to our library, it's a fantastic resource of anything typographic, graphic design -y, print -y, and it's all contained in this labyrinth of a building. So go and look online and find out more about visiting the library. It's definitely worth it if you want to come and have a look or do a tour. We've got letterpress workshops, bookbinding workshops, wood engraving, lots of different things for all abilities. So there's so much you can get involved here with and it's brilliant. So do check out our website if you want to do something different rather than sit in front of TV binging another box set or something. Anyway, I do that. I think it's good to do both. Anyway, so that's enough from me. So if you aren't aware, tonight's lecture is being held in memory of Justin Howells, who died on the 21st of February 20, in 2005. A good friend to the St. Bride Library and the wider typographic community, in 1999 he founded the original Friends of St. Bride Library with James Mosley. He was not only a distinguished scholar whose wide-ranging research was making an important contribution to our understanding of the types and lettering of the past, but 
he also put that scholarship into practice, learning to cast type by hand and demonstrate to others the techniques of a secretive and mysterious trade. This lecture is being given in its honour. And I'd just like to say a huge hello to Mimi and Brian Howes, who will be watching this, um, the recording after the event, who couldn't be with us today. So hello to you, and it's really lovely that we're, you can watch this after the event and be with us in, in that way. So nearly over from me, I promise. So tonight the talk will last around 45 to 60 minutes long and there'll be time for questions at the end. So if you're on Zoom, please do put any questions you have in the chat and we will get through as many as we can at the end. And finally, I say finally, I would like to introduce our speaker, Marcin, um, who is a designer at Figma and the author of Shift Happens, which is the upcoming book on the history of keyboards, which I believe has just gone to print or is about to go to print in July. Um, so if you would like to get his book, you can find out more on the website, shifthappens.site. It looks absolutely fantastic. And I know after hearing this talk, I'm definitely going to go and want to buy this book. We're definitely going to get it for the library here. So anyway, Martin has also previously worked as a designer at Medium, Google and Code for America. And so I think this is going to be a really fantastic insight into the abridged history of having fun with keyboards. So thank you very much for bearing with me. And now over to Martin. Thank you. Um, so, <laughs> thank you. Um, over the last five, six, seven years, I've looked at a lot of keyboards. <laughs> and I've actually looked at also a lot of keys. And I want to tell you about at least one of them today. Um, <laughs> uh, so, in the early 60s, just after the laser was invented, everybody was excited about trying to figure out what to do with it. Um, it might remind you of something more contemporary in technology, but there were all sorts of ideas what to do with lasers, and a scientist named Arthur Shawlow um, had this idea of how about we take a laser, put it inside a typewriter, connect it to a laser key, and the reason was to remove typos. Um, and the math actually checked out. If you timed it, it didn't need a lot of power, and if you timed it really well, uh, you could, since the dark ink is more excited about the energy from the laser than the light paper, if you time it well, you could get rid of the ink before the paper gets damaged, which was really, really interesting. And is it though, right? Like it sort of sounds like an overkill. It sounds like sort of one of those like techno utopian ideas of the 60s, like, you know, uh, maybe, maybe the spaceships that are powered by nuclear explosions happening just behind them, which is an actual thing that was proposed. Or, you know, all of these like super highways going through New York. Uh, underneath like what Robert Moses wanted to. And it sort of sounded like that's the kind of thing we were doing in the 60s, and then we kind of moved on uh, to kind of better ideas. Except there's three things that make the laser eraser really interesting. One is that this wasn't just a scientist. This was a co-inventor of lasers. So Arthur Scholo actually was really excited about like, doing something useful with lasers. Um, second of all, he built it. He built the laser eraser, at least a prototype. So never figure out how to quite put it inside the typewriter, but this is, this is a prototype with, with its own you know, power supply, um, obviously it's incredibly expensive. And he put it eventually in a sort of like something more compatible with the typewriter. And he brought it on national television in America to show how it works. And here it goes. So, uh, this is Walter Cronkite, by the way. So, this, is, this doesn't seem as impressive, but this is kind of cool, right? Like, I mean, it, it, you still see the impression of the, of the type that happens before, but if you type over it, um, you can barely see it happened. Um, which brings us to point number three. As ridiculous as this idea sounded, this was an actually huge problem worth solving. 
And so let's rewind a little bit to the beginnings of typewriters, right? So this is the first typewriter um, in about 1860s, 1870s. Yes, this is return, if you're curious. Um, you know, and if you look at its keyboard a little bit closer, it does look surprisingly familiar to us today, right? This is QWERTY more or less how we know it today. There are two small differences, if you can catch them. Uh, one of them is still there on French keyboards for complex reasons. Um, and, you know, this is 1860s, 1870s. These are the letters that were available there. Pretty much a lot of the things you already need. And eventually we moved on to better typewriters, right? Typewriters started being portable, maybe a little bit less intimidating. Um, eventually they become like pretty, became pretty reliable, like this one a, a couple of decades later. Uh, you could even start claiming they become somewhat attractive as plastics are entering the picture. And eventually they become even cheap. Uh, in a way that allowed them to sort of permeate all of these offices um, around the world. And, you know, it took us a while. Uh, we invented Shift as well, so we got a lot of other characters happening. Um, and if you haven't seen a typewriter being used, which I imagine all of you did, it sort of looked like this, right? Like this is marching, speaking, from, oh. Okay, so this is, this is the problem, right? What do I do now? Um, backspace, which existed pretty early on from typewriters, is just a space going back. So I cannot just like remove those letters. Um, and it was a huge problem, right? Because like kind of the only thing I can do right now, two options. Do kind of this, right, and type London, which only good for drafts, or grab a new page and start from scratch, right? So, so a pretty, pretty big problem. Um, so backspace, not really that useful. Um, and the early typewriters had a lot more limitations. For example, if you look at this, it starts looking like you're kind of missing some digits, right? And the reason is actually really interesting. So the reason is first and foremost, um, the keys, each key is more complexity, each key is more weight, each key is more price, I suppose. So uh, the funny thing that you can do is, you know, you have those digits here. Instead of zero, you can just type capital O. And instead of one, you can type lowercase l, which is actually redesigned to be somewhere in between a lowercase l and a digit one, right? So you start having this like interesting sort of substitutions, right? But that only gets you so far, right? What if you want a character that doesn't exist on the keyboard and it doesn't look like anything else? So there's a, quite a few options. First and foremost, you have like a pretty cheap option. I don't know how many of you can actually see it on a picture. Shout it out if you see something that gives you a hint. What's like sort of interesting about this typewriter? Exactly. There's a pencil that's built in a typewriter as a helper. You can sort of swing it back on a page. And this one is particularly for drawing lines that are, you know, even for basically spreadsheets, before spreadsheets. Um, but, you know, you could also just grab a pencil or a pen and just add to your typing, which actually sort of kept happening for decades on end. This is a Polish letter written uh, on a computer doesn't support polish, and all of these accents are added by hand. So that's like the cheap option. Here's the expensive option. You just grab two typewriters and bolt them together, so you have twice as many keys. This is a real product, so here is an example of one that has regular alphabet, and then all of the mathematical symbols, so we can actually gum it. And it has this really cool like, way to swing it to the other typewriter, so we don't lose the place on paper. So that's pretty cool, right? But incredibly expensive, cumbersome, not portable at all, so doesn't really work. But here's another option, and this is something that was encouraged and treasured in any ways. The very same thing that people hated when making typos actually helps you because you can overtype. So if I want a dollar sign and it doesn't exist on my typewriter, I press S, go backspace, and press a slash. Here's my dollar sign. 
Doesn't look so great, but it's a dollar sign, right? If I want um, a, an exclamation point, this, backspace, and a dot. Now, typewriters started understanding that this is necessary, so they added this power user shortcut. So if I hold a space, it doesn't advance until I release it. So I can hold space, let's say I want a semicolon. Hold space, press a colon, press a comma, release space. Um, so this can get you really far if you hate typography, right? So here's some examples. In books that taught you ty typing, uh, there were all these examples how to get those symbols that you don't have, including you know, infinity and ascent symbol. Um, depending on your typewriter's font, you actually had options, right? Maybe a dollar sign constructed this way would look better than a dollar sign constructed this way, etc. Um, if you forgot, this is what the dollar sign looks like normally. Um, be ready for this. This is even worse, a pound, right? <laughs> All of these are horrible options, but they're options. Um, and it started getting kind of wild. And I'm actually really nervous because this is actually really hard. So let me try. I'm going to try to do a few things. So a plus sign, if you don't have a plus sign, is a minus, backspace, apostrophe, backspace, go down, apostrophe, Go back, go down, apostrophe, go up, go up. Let's see. Um, yeah, it kind of looks correct, right? Um, um, exclam sorry, uh, equal, equal sign. Go up, go. I'm not even going to try the spacebar thing because I'm just going to confuse myself. So imagine there's a two in front of it. Um, percent sign. Uh, I think it's this. No, see, I already messed it up. Back, 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 up. Go back, space down. It was kind of cool. Um, a, bra a square bracket, it's square in name only. <laughs> Here, I'm going to put an X in it. I'm probably going to mess it up at some point. Here we go. Well, imagine it. Oh, imagine it. See, I tried to do a left arrow because that's what keyboards have. Something like this. Right? Imagine some of this looking better. Um, my favorite is a section sign where you just put one S on top of the other S. Um, so that's kind of cool, right? So all of these things existed. And it doesn't take long from seeing this and imagining, what if I use this just to have fun? So you start seeing random bits and pieces in, in typing books that, for example, tell you, um, how to construct a soldier from like a seven characters um, in like early 20th century. Um, and slowly there are books started getting dedicated to this idea that you can use a typewriter um, to create art. And art, you know, various definition of art, um, you know, some of this was relatively simple where you just like treat a character like a, basically a pixel today and you draw, and it's fun to look at some of these old books because you can actually see some people like counting and, and, and trying to figure it out in real time because this is an effort, right, to put this together. Um, here's some other portraits. Some of those are a little creepy looking, um, but they're there. Um, here's some with a few characters, right? So we start kind of experimenting. Um, here again, you can see the digits and the, and the kind of like check marks when somebody's checking exactly. Um, and it's really fun. And uh, this is the post-war prosperity, I suppose. Um, uh, there's one entire book that I found that is just religious typewriting. So it's all of the symbols. It's really fascinating. It's like a book with all of that kind of stuff. Um, or stuff like this. When you have a ribbon that has two colors, you can imagine doing something like this. Um, we've always wanted bigger letters. This is a way to get bigger letters because every typewriter obviously has just one font. So you get all of this sort of alphabets, um, including these drop cups that I actually really like. Again, overtyping um, parentheses. This is going to be a theme, overlapping parentheses. There was this one person who basically, at this point, you worry about paper surviving because you type like 20 something letters in one place. Uh, that might be a little hard on paper, right? But you can do that. 
Uh, you can basically just saturate paper with letters. And there's some like really beautiful details in some of this. This is a Russian artist um, who, if you look closely, you can see a numero in it, which is like one of my favorite typographical glyphs. And it's, for some reason, maybe one of you knows, it's very popular in Russia still today. Um, uh, there's some more and more complicated things happening um, like here. And obviously there's commercialization of all of this as well on the side. So this is one of the typewriter manufacturers trying to rebrand this as typees and having this like booklet. And of course you have to use their typewriter. I think it was Remington. Um, you know, that's fine. There's some people who started getting into like <laughs> producing um, portraits you could buy, maybe dead people, maybe people you love, uh, all that kind of stuff. I had to put it in here. Uh, this is 1981. Prince Charles is about to become a king any year now. But this is woman's realm, and it's like three pages of instructions. I did that at some point. It took two hours. I got blisters, and my typewriter's font is a little bit like squatty, so Prince Charles didn't come out as attractive as promised, I suppose, but um, you know, you could do that. It was like a thing you could do. Um, and then we moved on to mystery games, which is sort of reversing this whole thing, which is saying, what if we don't tell you what you're typing and you're gonna discover it as you're typing it, which is kind of exciting. <laughs> Sweater boy. Let's do a sweater, boy. Let's find some room. Okay, five spaces. One parenthesis. One underline. One backspace. One parenthesis. Second line. Okay, I'm just gonna speed it up uh, a little bit. So um, you don't have to watch me type all over the place. Um, so, Weather boy. Um, <laughs> there was a whole book with this fascinating cut of cast of characters. Um, like this sitcom, I think would be really cool. Um, and those names, I mean, those names, Marmaduke and Geraldine and Swe Sweater Boy for some reason. Um, I scan this book, it's on Internet Archive, if you want, there's like pages and pages of different sort of characters with different sizes. I don't know, they're all kind of weird looking, but it has a charm, I suppose. Um, we had soldiers before the war, we had golfers after war, obviously, um, and businessmen, this a man called Typo, confusingly, but again, look at the hair, right? The parenthesis, overlapping parenthesis is like a thing. Um, and, but here's what's really interesting about typewriters, is that they give you this rigidity, right? One color, maybe two. Specific grid, paper of a certain size, and a bunch of characters, and you cannot do much more, which can be rewarding in the same way every constraint can actually help with creativity. But once you learn it, you can break those rules because the typewriter still exists in a universe of atoms that don't care about any of those things. So, most of typewriters had a lever you can grab and move the paper however you want and type wherever you want, which I'm not gonna, oh, this actually came out really well. I'm gonna take a screenshot. Huh. But, um, like, you know, you could like get, I don't know, get, get here, I don't know, add a cigarette. Is this working? I don't know. I'm not an artist, um, but you know you have freedom to do whatever you want. And again, you can see people embracing that freedom. This is actually a contemporary artist, Leslie Nichols, who did these beautiful portraits um, uh, with also feminist messages throughout. And they're gorgeous, and they kind of use the same property. You can move however you want. Same thing here. This is like somebody who just like used the letter just to create a texture, which I find really, really fascinating. Right? And then there's another step, which is there's nothing that prevents you from rotating paper. <laughs> and I don't know what I'm gonna do with this because honestly, this is getting really, really intense. But you know, imagine you could like maybe do like a little star. I don't know. Um, this is really hard, especially 
as you're speaking. But anyway, I'm gonna show you some good stuff. So here's, even in those books, they were really worried because this is complex, right? Like I tried to do this, this is not really easy to do because you take away anything, it's just like you can rotate it how much you want. But there were some examples of that. Again, people, maybe not super, super great, but you know, people took it in all sorts of really interesting directions. And um, this is another artist, this is another contemporary artist from, as you can tell here, um, that uses all of these techniques to create those like really, really cool kind of visuals of London um, with like a little splash of red um, and here on location. I don't know if he typed it there or just brought it there, but it's still kind of cool. Um, I had to put it in here for obvious reasons. Here's another artist. This is from a typewriter. This doesn't look like it because it's zoomed out and also because he used different colors, like different ribbons that were specially colored. But I'm gonna show you a proof. If you zoom in really, really close, you can see the letter M right here. And you can see this whole texture based off of all of these impressions, which it's itself really interesting, right? So you can see the dots, you know, and all of these things maybe um, coming into play here. And then there's, you know, concrete poets jumping onto the typewriter and trying to do something. Again, parenthesis here. Uh, I love these things because they don't look like typewriter things at all. Or here with this creases from the paper. I don't know, this is just beautiful. I don't know how to talk about art, but you know, as you can imagine, people took it in all sorts of really interesting directions, including embracing the thing that people hated about typewriters, which is getting your fingers dirty. Um, or actually using the smudges to say something. Um, and so we've had it for a while, but then typewriters themselves started changing in interesting ways. And especially this era of typewriters that we maybe kind of forget about because it was a transitional era between two bigger um, kind of times. This is a typewriter Olympia reporter. Uh, let's zoom in on the keyboard again. And yeah, I'm gonna ask you again, what do you see here that's maybe interesting? Like what stands out to you? Exactly, it's a red X. And the reason it's red is pretty interesting. And again, not gonna blow your mind today because we've seen better things. But imagine this in the 60s. I'm holding an X, right? All right, that's cool. Now I'm holding it a little bit more. And the typewriter types itself, which is mind blowing, um, or at least was. It's like the first time that the action of your finger was disconnected from what the typewriter was doing. So this is a regular typewriter from before where you, know, you press the key and it moves the tie bar to where the paper is, right? R wrapped around the roller. And it, there is some you know, weights and stuff added so your kind of finger press is a little bit smoother, right? Because otherwise it would be much rougher on a typewriter and you would see letters being darker and lighter depending on what you do. But it's still basically your finger doing the work. Now, if you attach a motor to a typewriter, this is real, this is a real product, before you know, they integrated it, you introduce this interesting thing, which is a roller which spins constantly, and when you press a key, you're no longer moving the tie bar to the paper. The tie bar sort of uses the momentum of the roller to swing back, and you just tell it to do so. So it's sort of abstracted away. And what this allows to do is a few things. One, typing is now much easier. In a way, again, we don't appreciate because it's so easy, but compared to manual typewriters, B, it's consistent, because no matter what you do, you just have to press it to activate this thing, and it just, the roller takes over and gives you constant energy. And then it's also like allows you to do repetition. And uh, it was an X, but it was also uh, the, the hyphen, so you can do the same thing if you wanna like underline something, just for effect. Um, I think the dot was also there. Just a few keys because again, every one of those is complexity. Every one of them is maintenance, price, weight, all of this stuff. So yeah, the dot and uh, I think you can see it. And, and I kind of lied to you because you will see why, but they were so proud of this that basically they named everything power, like power windows in your car. So you have power return, power shift, power backspace, and power tab because <laughs> it's cool, right? 
no, everything now is disconnected from your fingers in a way, and it's consistent and works easier. And there, you see a lot of sort of electric returns and power returns in the 60s and 70s appearing here and there in typewriters. But this is actually what I wanted to talk about as well. It's not just the power, power, but there's also, you know, you have a backspace, but I also have a correction key. And this is sort of like what brings to the end um, the saga of the laser eraser. So throughout late 19th century, early 20th century, there was this whole cottage industry dedicated to helping you fix your typos. All sorts of ribbons, all sorts of liquids, all sorts of like pencils that look like erasers confusingly, shields so you can only erase the one character and not accidentally other things. It's still a mess. Right? If you have carbon copies, what do you do then? If your typo is at the bottom of the page, you might choose a different strategy than if it's at the top of the page. There are pages in manuals dedicated to how to fix a typo. There's all sorts of professional later on, you know, some of you might recognize liquid paper, white out. There was all, all of the sort of um, artifacts you could buy. Uh, and those companies made millions of, of just helping you erase typos. And so this starts making sense, right, in a way, um, because it would be a boon to the whole industry to fix this. Except maybe not with a laser. Um, they tried to do it, Shaolo and Sanford University, tried, they spent like over a decade trying to make it happen. They tried to talk to all sorts of companies and they all rejected them because lasers are, are expensive and eventually people realize they're also dangerous and maybe you don't want like a laser close to your eyes, uh, that, you know, all those kind of stuff. So they failed in some ways because of that, but they also failed because there was a competitor that figured out how to solve it in a better way. Uh, and again, something we probably don't even recognize today, uh, IBM released Correcting Selectric in 1973. They put Correcting in the name because it was such a huge deal. And again, you can see here that it has a backspace and it has a correction key. And the backspace is the same thing I showed you, which is just going back and overtyping. Um, and, but this key was kind of re a revolution. And what Shaolo tried to do with physics, they did with chemistry. So they basically had this special ribbon. They replaced an ink ribbon with a film ribbon, and they had this other lift ribbon next to it, the black and the white one here. And let's zoom in a little bit here. So the way it worked was amazing because basically if you type something, it moved the film to paper, like you imagine with impact, but the film would only permeate paper over time. It took like hours. So if you catch it, quickly, you could actually get it out of the paper completely. And that's what the second ribbon was for. And it's basically just like a little sticky ribbon that just grabs things. It doesn't grab the paper, it just grabs the letter. And you can see here already used, right? So these are some letters that I typed and some letters that I removed. And it worked marvelously. It was integrated into the typewriter. It wasn't as expensive. And IBM just like made so much money on this. And the laser eraser never happened. Because it was, you know, it was sort of like if all you have is a hammer, you know, uh, uh, that kind of stuff, right? So obviously the creator of laser wanted to put a laser here, but the answer was boring tapes. And so this never happened. What happened was this, this sort of like last hurrah of typewriters, the last innovation in typewriting, which they named all sorts of different ways. They even had this like special shapes for those keys, um, special names like word eraser, all of this kind of stuff. Um, and it sounds silly now, right? In a way, those kind of transitional products often are silly because the answer to all of this was computers, right? Like computers are so bad at caring for your data that you lose it by default. Like all of your types are gone when you close your computer, well, not anymore, but you know what I mean. Like the other thing is the hard thing. Um, so let's look at computers. some British computers from the 50s, some American ones. They all use typewriters because screens were A, not invented yet, or B, too expensive. And, you know, you might have seen some of them in museums or maybe even used some of them. Um, all kind of look like this. And then, 
in the 60s, there was an experiment, MIT, and where people were asked to sit in front of a computer, and most of them have never touched a computer before, sit in front of a keyboard, and some of you might recognize this. How do you do? Please tell me your problem. Um, I am giving a talk and not sure my jokes are landing. Here we go. Why do you say your jokes are there? They are not, maybe. Um, oh, geez, 20 pairs? I don't know. Um, so, <laughs> you don't understand me. So, um, um, You've all probably heard of chat GPT and all of this stuff. Um, so this is technically artificial intelligence. This is not machine learning, but this is artificial intelligence. In the 60s, it's pretty rudimentary. Um, we could go on forever, but you know, we kind of start seeing that this would be kind of pointless. Um, all of this is basically some pretty rudimentary rules talking to you about like, um, you know, some some very vague answers to keep you going, some sort of rudimentary sort of like father means family, wife means family, uh, some worries about computers, even then in the 60s already, you know. Um, but this was an experiment by Joseph Weizenbaum who wanted to kind of convince people that this is not a way to communicate. There's no way to type away your feelings, and there's no way for people and computers to talk. Because in order to talk, there's a lot more that's needed than just letters from A to Z and a space bar. There needs to be like some sort of a connection. There needs to be like all of this like channel of, you know, a, 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 he talked about a gaze or a touch or, or, a, or, you know, breaks or pregnant pauses and all of this like other things that we as humans have and computers don't and never will, and the joke was kind of on him for two reasons. One, people loved Eliza. Like, people would spend hours writing even after they told, this is a computer. It's actually really stupid, but they were like, there was something there that worked. And the second is, of course, that that's what we cannot do today. Most of the time, we speak with our fingers. Right? We don't write with our fingers anymore, we speak. We're all on chats, we're all on group chats, we're all on Slack. We just speak like this. And we talk to other people, and it's fine. I mean, sometimes it's not fine, but it's sort of more fine than we all expected. And, you know, this is 60s, so computers kind of moved from... The person who took these photos in the audience, which... I thought you might enjoy also this photo. They're great photos. Um, their computers became sort of smaller like this. And as they become more connected, first through small networks, then through internet, people started talking to each other exactly that way, with fingers on their keyboards. And soon, they found a way to approximate all of those things that Weizenbaum said are missing. These are the Western emoticons. That you probably know them. Um, these are the uh, Japanese or Asian uh, cow emoji. It's like a sort of like a different strand, which is interesting that the Western ones are all about the mouth. The Japanese ones are all about the eyes. It's really kind of cool if you just compare them. And then, of course, the cow emoji led to emoji, which this is like an early generation of. And then, of course, we all know what they are today. And I'm not going to speak about the obvious things because I want to talk about the strange things, but this is 80s and 90s and especially 2000s, right? But even in the 60s, there was one group of computers and a bunch of American universities called Plato. And they were interconnected, at least within the university. Uh, they were used for education. They had like, pretty standard keyboards. There's nothing kind of strange here, really. Um, and, you know, all of this was kind of replaced by this, as you can imagine, roughly the same amount of characters. And you could talk to a human being at this point, and you could say, hello, you know, 
and maybe they would write back, hi, smiley face. That's kind of cute, except Plato didn't have smiley faces. Didn't have emoticons, emoji, anything. This is too early for it. This is the 60s. What happened was Plato had the thing that typewriters had that computers don't anymore because it was so close to typewriters that they wanted it. They had overlapping characters. So, and this is, uh, this is another beauty of this, that the resolution of the screen was so low that if you overlap them enough, you could basically create graphics, like here. So, you know, you could, uh, it had a regular computer backspace, right? So I could actually delete things, right? Because that would be weird. But I could also like not delete, but just go back. So let me show you something. So this is also hard. Oh, she, I chose the wrong backspace. So here, here we go, warp tax. Cool smiley face. Here's another one. If you just switch, if you just forget W, then the smile gets a little funny. There's, there's another thing like T. <laughs> this is kind of cool, right? Um, let me show you Batman. Um, here we go. Oh my God. Okay, here, apostrophe, and then a plus sign makes it happen. Um, so I'm not gonna like do this live again because this is like really, really stressful, but um, um, people started doing all sorts of things and discovering, um, you know, all sorts of faces, as you can imagine, with all sorts of emotions because we want that, right? We want that in communication. We wanted this in the 60s. Um, this unhappy face. And there's all sorts of like really interesting things. You can also go up and down because typewriters allowed you to do that. There's, some of them had cute names um, for mnemonics. There's a TV set, a lollipop, and a flower, and a mouse. You can also move left and right, of course, and a bump where you can kind of see the F, you know? It, it still all connects, right? You can still see the F, um, but it also looks like a bump, which is really cool. Uh, a bug, and again, this is all starts getting kind of involved. Um, and some patterns, I really love this arrow, you know? Um, and like even an entire set of chess pieces uh, that you can actually use to, look at this, <laughs> look at this. <laughs> it's like half your memory just for a night. And you can play chess on play though. And people kind of started collecting those things and kind of sharing them and we kind of lost this by now, but I thought there was this kind of beautiful moment where, where computers was trying very hard to be a typewriter to a great effect. Uh, but of course, we moved on to other um, computers, right? Like computers still kind of look like this. Some of them maybe didn't have a screen. Some of them did. People did kind of art like typewriters here, um, even political art, which I, I support um, here. And um, then, Computers became smaller. Um, it's funny, like in the 80s, we had a cute name for this called microcomputers because they used to be so tiny, um, which is funny in hindsight, right? But of course, it made sense. Um, and this is one of the most popular ones. And you know, again, it had a regular character set, it had lowercase, etc. Um, and you know, you can do the thing that you did with typewriters, except you couldn't overlap anymore, right? We kind of lost that because that was more complicated. You could do like art, like typewriter art. Um, but they did something even more interesting because a lot of them were dedicated to home and, uh, and education and stuff like that. So you started seeing stuff like this, which is a different character set that dedicated to sort of approximate graphics because this is still cheaper than real graphics. It was called semi-graphics for obvious reasons. And then, um, you know, even on some keyboards you could see a little legend, like what, you know, where they are, what they do. It was sort of like this alternative keyboard for graphically looking things. And people would do, started doing really interesting things with that same way they started doing interesting things with typewriters. So, you know, these are all characters, right? I apologize in advance for the next slide. I'm gonna move past this really quickly. But stuff like this, um, stuff like this, uh, a lot of those computers started showing, supporting colors, maybe just seven, maybe just 15, but much more than typewriters ever allowed. So you start seeing stuff like this, really interesting art, <laughs> like this. And, you know, I mentioned earlier that you couldn't really change your character set on a typewriter, right? Because it was cast in metal. 
There were some exceptions. You know, you could sometimes buy these extended characters from third parties that you mount on top, and there were catalogs of this. It's super cumbersome, right? You would get the quality that was better than a pencil, but not many people did it. But with computers, you can do whatever. You can make the C look different. You can make the at sign look different. You can make them look like nothing, like what they originally looked like, because there's nothing preventing you um, from doing that. So you start seeing R. These are probably letters like A, B, and C, but they don't look like letters anymore. Um, or even people customizing color palettes, because that's also possible on some computers. And uh, there were all sorts of genres, like ASCII art, ANSI art, Petsky art, named by sort of different standards for like what those characters are and how they look. And they all have like their own sort of unique personalities. And I share some links at the end if you want to kind of explore. Um, and also this, and I'm curious, who can recognize which computer it came from? Yeah. <laughs> some people heard it. This is ZX Spectrum, I think 1982. Uh, you can tell because... Well, there's many ways to tell. You sort of just feel it if you love the specy, right? But, you know, it's, it's the aspect ratio, the, the, the O, the C, the, the pound sign, of course. I chose it for a reason. Um, you know, and the color palette, right? And, and so, so different computers had their own kind of art, personalities of art as well. And the kind of interesting things about a lot of the ASCII art is that some of those characters were just kind of big blocks, you know, two by two, three by three, so you can start seeing things like this, which looks like just big pixels, right? And there's some creati creativity involved in like, some of the color combinations are not as available as others, um, but people use this again to great effect. And it's much easier to draw something that's like 60 by 30 pixels than, you know, like real, a real image. Like the same way we've seen before. Um, or you can just forego color and use it to animate something slightly. And this is so much easier to do than anything else. And imagine you could put something on your TV that's animated. Also, I love the pan at the bottom. It's just like so cute. Um, so anyway, so, but then there's another layer to computers that we haven't explored yet, which typewriters don't have, which is, let's pick this art, for example. Do you think somebody typed it in or do you think they didn't, right? At some point, you, you don't know, because computers have this property where you can just tell them to do something for you. And so there, very early on, there was this one line of the programming language called BASIC that was traveling like wildfire to all of these computers. It was just this. It was just this one incantation, two and a half commands. But once you run it, it does something like this. That's it. And again, not that impressive today, right? But uh, the, basically the command says, pick a number uh, that's 206.5 or 204.5, I think, or two, no, 205.5 or 206.5, round it to whatever, however you round it. So it ends up like pick one of the two characters, uh, pick the letter assigned to that number, go over and over again. And the beauty is that it's, it's simple and fun, but you pick those two characters um, that happen to be the N and M here, the diagonals, and it just looks so cool. And it sort of generates this endless maze uh, with one line of code. And then as you start messing with the numbers here, for example, you can slant it one way or the other more, or you can pick a different kind of characters. You know, the formula started getting really complicated, but this is really fascinating entry point to like generative art based on the same principle as, you know, typewriters like 100 years ago, but now nobody's typing. And this brings us to stuff like this, which is, you know, if you look closely, these are some of the same characters, but I can no longer tell if this is somebody typing it by hand, or is this somebody writing a program to effectively type it. And depending on how you feel about it, this is great or scary, but that happened in the 80s. And then there's another layer. This is actually like a personal thing for me. This is a Polish magazine, 1986. Um, and you type this whole program in, not a very long program either, and it does this. That's so cool. Um, I mean, okay, it's fine, I guess. 
But like, imagine this. I was like looking at it for, uh, no, maybe not hours. Maybe hours. I was a kid. I don't know. Um, this is really cool. And then, so like very quickly, you start people like taking this and actually generating movies. This is not going to be high art. Uh, I'm just going to tell you in advance. But this is like kind of cool. You can save it on a tape or a diskette, give it to somebody else, or put it in a magazine. Or like you have to create a format to save it, which requires you to be some sort of a nerd. But, you know, it's like a classic, you know, it's basically Shakespeare, um, um, you know, so, uh, or this, like, again, I don't know if somebody typed it in or, but it's beautiful, I think. Um, some of them are more modern than the others, but I just kind of want to share different things. Um, and then, of course, like, that also helped games. Games used to look like this, but the semi-graphics helped them look a little bit more like this. So again, not as impressive compared to like really professional games with graphics, but you could do this. Like this is not complicated. This allowed people to do something graphical without actually graphics and allow it to run on like pretty underpowered computers, which is especially important for, you know, developing countries that maybe are like decades, decades behind like sort of America. And then that software thing started making things more and more complicated, as you can imagine. So let's look at something else for a change, and that's international keyboards. So the American typewriter had it easy, because American English only has 26 letters. There's only like one language that has fewer, I think Greek, but Greek also has to have English letters, because that's how it works. So basically, this is like the, the, the simplest thing you could do. 26, you know, you can see the two. You can see zero on this typewriter, which is interesting. Not one yet, because it takes a while um, for the technology to march forward. But 26 letters, right? Like, well, what do you do, for example, in German? Like, you have a bunch of these other things. So, you know, you start maybe sacrificing some punctuation or some extra characters and, and putting those, you know, uh, sharp S and the umlauts, um, you know, in the right places. Well, what do you do in Russian where you have a lot more letters? where you sacrifice even more of the punctuation, right? You demote the digits to be under shift, so punctuation is easy to access. You can't really add keys easily, because again, that's complicated and hard, and because a lot of those typewriters come from America, so they want to change their assembly lines just for other languages. So that's kind of problematic, but that's a whole different subject. Um, anyway, Russian, right? it still kind of works. How about Japanese? Some of you might know Japanese, maybe more than I do, and so you already kind of know where I'm going with this. So Japanese has maybe the most complex writing system in the universe, or one of the most complex writing systems. And again, I'm probably going to mess it up, but I think it works something like this. You have about 50 characters that are it's called hiragana or katakana. I'm sorry, I can't really tell them apart, but that's just because I don't know Japan. Japanese, and, and they, they're not, it's not an alphabet, it's a syllabary because they're syllables. But basically, it sort of functions the same way. So you have like about 50 of those, and that's fine. But then you have the other 50, and then it becomes really complicated because it's like a, quite a few more than any other alphabet, sorry, any alphabet out there. But then you also have to accommodate Latin because, you know, maybe you're writing about somebody from, uh, from you know, Europe or America. So you have to do this. And then, of course, you have thousands of kanji that are living next to all of this. And what do you do? What, like, what kind of keyboard can accommodate this? Right? And the answer is surprising in two ways. One is that, well, there's no keyboard that can accommodate it, right? Like Japanese or Chinese typewriters look like this, which is much more close to a printing press than a typewriter. They had one key. You move the key to the right letters, swing it to paper, uh, you can close up here, you can kind of like, you know, you, touch typing is hard or impossible, <laughs> um, but it's something, right? It works and, and you could get really good at it. You could actually rearrange some of those letters to help you reduce the movement and some people really did that. Um, um, so, but that's really complex, and it's really far away from the sort of accessibility of the keyboard that, that you know, uh, America or Europe knew at that time. So what happened was, again, computers kind of helped in strange ways. Um, so 
This is a little bit of a later typesetting keyboard, um, and it has fewer keys than the letters that you just saw. And the reason is that there are four shifts under the feet of this person. So when, if you have four shifts, you can reduce, you know, like the, the keys by like 75%. So that's pretty cool. And you can see this like, oh, what if, we, what if we had more shifts? So you can have 12 shifts on the left for one hand and this many characters. You can see each one has like 12 labels. And it's sort of an interesting thing that computer keyboards allow you to do, but it's still not getting you anywhere uh, where you can go really, really fast. And the answer to this was something that you already probably know about and use today, which was QWERTY. Like surprisingly, like what computers allowed to do is sort of create this abstraction layer between your fingers and what's coming out. So basically a lot of people write in Japanese by writing the word in Latin letters and just using software to pick whatever kana or kanji they want. And even some other, you know, similar uh, 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 words. And, and, and it's, it's kind of amazing how complex those things are. You know, they have all of these sort of options. Uh, they kind of autocomplete, autocorrect. They have dictionaries. They help you actually understand. They help you switch between full width and half width, which is another challenge that Japanese has that a lot of languages don't. And it's just sort of like amazing. And there's like, you can even draw, some, draw something on a trackpad today and it detects what letter it is. This is me trying it, so I apologize if this is bad. But, um, and, you might recognize it today because basically this technology from Japan in the 80s moved to the rest of the world um, for these other reasons. Like American English didn't require any of what I just showed you, but it required autocorrect. And this is, this is actually the first autocorrect in the world. It just has nine things, which I found kind of funny. It's just nine. <laughs> You could add more, but it just has nine things. Like, it's, it's so ridiculously simple. It's 1995. And, you know, then eventually what happened, it, that enabled iPhone from happening. And iPhone created this, this another abstraction layer where a keyboard doesn't really exist anymore. Like, this is just pixels that don't, are not there. I mean, they're there sometimes, but they don't. And this allowed the keyboard to just basically be whatever you want. Like, maybe change the color, maybe change the orientation, maybe have this extra callouts for diacritics uh, in Vietnamese, super important. Um, maybe actually help you with your typos as you're making them and kind of really blur the lines between what is the keyboard and what is the screen or predict what you're gonna write or change to something else that you might be used to. And I'm showing you things you all know, um, but you know, there were some experiments with other layouts or semi-experiments semi and of course swiping and even, like, is this a keyboard anymore, um, if I'm speaking to it? Um, and what this allowed to do, which brings us back to the rest of the story, is this actually enabled emoji to work. Because um, this is not the emoji keyboard, but I just put it here because I found, like, you can actually buy it. And it's just, like, one thing, which I, 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 I like the vibe of this. I don't know. This is still, an, this is still sort of, I think, cow emoji, right? Because this is from Japan. But... Um, like, there's as many emoji today as probably, like, glyphs in Japanese. And it uses some of the same technologies that Japan needed to do to write, and we now all use to just chat or emote, I guess. So there's all of this frequently, frequently used, and you can hold things, and there's, you know, we, we all know this, including, like, actually, like, describing the emoji by name, like, you could, Japanese glyphs. Um, that's kind of cool, and we like so many layers behind this, right? Like, like even the computer keyboard is just like a wire with electrons connecting the screen, the thing. The, the iPhone keyboard is nothing. It doesn't exist. I, I can't even draw it. I try to draw like it's, it, it's just not there. It's all an illusion. And again, maybe cool, maybe scary. I don't know, but it's sort of where we are right now um, with this. And, and so um, I wanted to sort of tell you a little bit why I love this and why I sort of covered some of the strange nooks and crannies and, and didn't really spend as much time with emoji and other things because I love the technologies and the, and the inventions and the stuff that's sort of in between other things, in the eras that we all forgot about or in, in the things that you had to do at this moment 
Um, and 10 years later, the technology would render it obsolete, but it, you still did it. Like, you know, this person trying to, I can, can't get over this laser, the inventor of laser, um, or the power everything on these electric keyboards for like a decade or two before computers just took over and made them so laughable. Or, or this, this is a photo of me actually typing on a Play-Doh in Seattle, which I, I, I was so excited about. Like, I did this. Um, or, you know, one of those Japanese keyboards with like 12 shifts. Uh, they're just huge, you know. Um, and, and then some of those things connect in really, really surprising ways. So this is another typewriter, typewriter artist, Paul Smith. And Paul Smith, um, he's gone now, but he uh, was afflicted by cerebral palsy. So the typewriter wasn't there to help him with a rigid grid or a character set that was limited and helped his creativity. He didn't need any of this, right? This doesn't look like a typewritten thing at all. But what it allowed him to do was like help with his condition because he could hold one hand with the other hand and just type the letters. And the typewriter mechanism itself was rigid enough they would help him do consistent results and actually create art in a way he couldn't with a pencil or a pen or a brush. And the typewriter inventors didn't think of this, but this, this sort of strange confluence of events allowed him to do that. And he, he, he could go on his website and, and still see, um, or the website in his memory, I suppose, and, and see uh, some of this are like really impressive. It took him months to do that. Um, or, you know, the, the, the other thing that's sort of uh, uh, surprising that comes back in, in new ways, and this is sort of the last visit to the typewriter land. So I think I showed you that, you know, you can hold a space and you can type all over. Um, but there are some keys that were actually, they were called dead keys. You know, like typography sometimes don't have like the best, doesn't have the best names for things, or this old typography. But basically the keys that wouldn't advance the typewriter. And they're still on computers today, but you know, for example, if you want an A with an accent, you would put an accent, the typewriter wouldn't advance, and you would put an A, right? And there's, there's a bunch of them that, especially on international keyboards, they were easier than having you know, two letters with different accents, especially for stuff like umlauts that, that's reused. And so we have that on computers today. We cannot overtype with one exception, which is when you use this, um, you know, this is actually happens when you hold an A, and you, in, under the hood, sometimes it actually looks like two characters. And uh, you can actually, you know, kind of disassemble them and, and see that they're there, but they won't be there for you, right? It's sort of an illusion. And the funny thing is that, um, obviously, some people started using it for art. So if you just combine all of this sort of diacritics, uh, this is something called Zalgo. I don't really understand it, but there's like a theme where you can just keep adding them and it looks a certain way. And it's like, I think it's like used to typeset scary things, but computers allow you to do that, right? Like this, this came from like um, combining diacritics, but they allow you to do that. But also um, this existed. There was one Chinese typewriter that didn't really make it that used this in physical world, it has this little window and it had this eight keys at the bottom and it's exactly the same thing before computers, which I love. Uh, this was called the Magic Eye typewriter. It, it, it didn't succeed in the market, but somebody actually, and it's so big because there's all of these rotating wheels and cylinders in the middle, but somebody made this before software, which I find kind of fascinating. And of course, in the world of software, this also exists in a different way. You know, we all know emoji, Right, and a lot of them are pretty simple. But I don't know how many of you know that like, a lot of emoji are actually like complicated groups of characters that, that the computers sort of abstract away for you. So for example, the polar bear is a bear combined with a snowflake, which I find kind of poetic. Like if you sort of, this is what it looks under the hood. It's a bear and what's called a zero width joiner, which is sort of like combine those two and a snowflake. And don't ask me about the variation selector, it's too complicated, but um, that's kind of cool. Um, heart on fire is heart plus, pretty obvious, it's kind of cool. I wish you could add fire to other things like this, but that's the only option. Um, a female astronaut is a woman in a rocket <laughs> glued together, which, I, which is kind of, I find kind of cool, but it's super not consistent. So like a, a, a guy gymnast is like, a person doing cartwheel combined with a male sign. So it's kind of, again, 
you don't have to worry because you just select from the big quote unquote keyboard, but under the hood is like super fascinating. And then of course there's um, skin tone colors. So like a handshake is two hands with different color, skin color modifiers joined together. And of course it's inconsistent because um, two people holding, oh, this is very confusing, isn't it? Uh, two people holding hands is a separate thing that's actually called a handshake. And they all uh, have, you know, um, different genders and different skin tones. And then uh, the most complicated of them all, I don't even know what this emoji means technically. It's like a kissy love. Is that a thing? Um, but you know, there's, these two people have genders, these two people have different skin colors, and it all, under the hood, it looks like one emoji, except, and you all know this, if you don't update your Android or iOS and somebody sends you a new emoji and your computer doesn't know what to do with it, and then it looks like this thing on the right. So now you know why. But it's funny because there's still these combining things. They just happen on a very different layer. And again, hidden away from you in a way the typewriter couldn't because there's nothing that you can hide in a typewriter. But on a computer, you can hide everything. Some other things, there are in transition and kind of themes coming in and out throughout ages is we've always wanted bigger letters. Um, we've always wanted semi-graphics, even before semi-graphics, somewhere here in this building, there's probably a drawer that looks exactly like this because it's like easy to do those things, especially if they're consistent width and height. So this is like a pretty universal idea that predates all of us and will be there after we're all gone. Uh, we will always want to say, I don't care about something in whatever uh, thing is possible. We will always want to represent ourselves in whatever medium we have, including on typewriters and on computers and of course with emoji. And even before typewriters, we just like seeing ourselves in what we do. And you know, uh, computers came and Computers will evolve into whatever, um, but the themes remain. Like there's all of this capitalist emoji, like there were capitalist as, uh, typewriter art. Um, the sum of the limitations that helped Paul Smith in, in using a typewriter was the sum of the similar limitations that helped somebody make this game, which is it's so much easier to do this um, than like a real graphics in 3D, right? But it still looks incredible and it still has creativity. Um, and uh, I don't know how many of you were like looking. I'm surprised Eliza still remembers what we talked about. I forgot that I built it that way. But that's the scary part about computers, right? But I don't know how many of you uh, were like, you know, doing the chat GPT thing and like following that. The reason I have been a good being smiley face is so creepy because computers are not meant to use smiley faces. Like we learned this. The smiley faces are for us. So that's like another thing that, you know, we keep learning in new ways. And there's this really fascinating trend, like the, you know, the early, the first time electric typewriters allow you to move the keyboards away from a typewriter. It was a huge thing. It's what eventually led to like us goofing around in a Google spreadsheet many, many decades later. Or this sort of pencil typing, like you could buy, if you had a ZX81, which some of you might have had, you could buy this extra room with semi-graphics that it didn't originally have, which was sort of like getting a pencil for a computer in an abstract way. And bad graphic jokes, um, just they continue and they will always be there with us before uh, and after. And even like, People did movies with typewriters. I apologize for the flickering. Um, I hope it doesn't bother anybody. But um, again, so much easier to do this than a real movie. And there were some people who were like really dedicated to erasing typos and, and, and removing things. And there were some other people who just who use emoji not even in writing but in graphic software just to create art like this. Sort of the opposite. They don't want to erase anything. Just want to keep piling things on top in a way that computers don't really easily allow. And there's also typewriter or artists, uh, ASCII artists that have been around forever and they will be around forever. This is, the, the person on the right is Raquel Meyers who uh, does this really beautiful thing where she, uh, either live or uh, through live streams, she sits in front of a computer and just like creates art for hours or end, and it's not just like adding, it's sometimes redrawing, which is this interesting way to do this that I've never seen before. And it's like mesmerizing, and, and some of her work is like genuinely beautiful, and, and you can sort of 
it's hard to even say like, where does it end, where does it begin? And then there's also this, which I find, I don't know if I'm even gonna say or just leave it on screen and for you to, to process on your own. I don't even know how to describe what this is. <laughs> it's like a multiple level of pointless, but you could say art is that, right? Like if you're cynical. So I just, I just find it so funny and kind of inventive and beautiful. And this brings us to, to the end, which is also the beginning, as always. Um, first typewriter, 1867, when it was started, and 1873, when it was first released, almost exactly 150 years ago, which is kind of incredible. Um, as always with any product, there were early adopters, and, and for this particular typewriter, here's one of them. Um, he loved his typewriter, he bought it very early on, started using it, uh, wrote a bunch of things on it, including a book, although it was actually his secretary who wrote it. Uh, that's often like this, unfortunately. And then he started getting fed up with it, as you can see here, because if you're an early adopter, that's what happens to you. Is that a new iPhone? It's like, oh God, come on. And of course, sometimes you do it on purpose, but like, he got fed up with it. He's just like, you know what? Like, I don't care anymore. This is so frustrating. Anytime I write something to somebody, they were like, what did you do? What is this thing that you wrote with? I, like, they don't even care what I write. So I'm fed up with this. And also don't use my name in any way, um, which of course they did. They literally would publish this letter because Samuel Clements is Mark Twain as as I learned in the process of doing this. Mark Twain was one of the early adopters of the typewriter. But before he got fed up with the typewriter, he wrote a bunch of letters, and I wanna show you the first one. Um, he's writing to his brother. Um, it's clearly, <laughs> the typewriter is not great, um, but of course it's the first typewriter. I'm trying to get the hang of this newfangled writing machine, not making a shining success of it. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I, I think I'll get it. I think I, I'll get into it. Um, but there is something sort of interesting that's happening at the very top of that. Um, this line. That's his daughter, Susie, who got a hold of, of course, he would get a hold of his typewriter before he did. And he, she just like slams the keys as you would as we all did probably at some point. You can see her going in like circles and, and, and trying it. The, the thing on the right is probably not backspace because that was not invented yet. There was probably the mechanism getting stuck. So there's some interesting archeology span that you could do. But it's also this interesting thing that 150 years later, we don't know what it's for, which is the thing that's happening in between A and Q. This three dot symbol. It was a key right next to the A. It was a key that was outputting those three dots. It was only there on the first typewriter. It was never there on the typewriter after that. It was not documented because they did not document anything. Unfortunately for me, unfortunately for everybody who cares about QWERTY, but it was there and it was outputting those three dots. And we don't know. And you can try to figure it out from surviving evidence. You can try like here to notice that they tried to combine it to do a dollar sign with an S and an, and an I. There was also a one because, of course, and the three dots, and it's sort of looking kind of funny. Was that the reason it was for? I don't know. It, the, the first type had different fonts. And there's another dollar sign right there. It looks a little bit better, but like, was it really there? Um, Mark Twain and other people use this as parentheses because parentheses were not there. Was it really there? for parentheses? I don't know. I wish I knew. I wish I had an answer for you. But I think the main reason that key was there was it was fun. It was fun to put boxes together. It was fun. It looked like something else. It was a, maybe it was the first semi-graphic. I don't know. There's all of these examples of all of these tricolon things. This is the first example, and you see those boxes over and over again in official print samples in all sorts of stuff. Yeah, of course, sometimes they're spreadsheets, sometimes they're used for real, but often it's just this. 
and I'd like to believe maybe that's what this was for. And in a way, like, you know, every key tells you a story, and maybe that's what I want to leave uh, this talk with. Like, uh, like the, why is zero on the right? It should be before one, right? Obviously, that's mathematics. It was there because zero was added before one was added, and you couldn't add zero next to two, because they're just kind of funny. So they put it kind of like pretending it's a 10. They did it like a century ago, and we still have zero in that space. Except in Hungary, of course, because Hungary type, had a different story with typewriters that arrived much later than typewriters in many other countries. So if you go to Hungary, the zero will be where it belongs, and in every other keyboard, it's somewhere else. And it also tells the story that I shared with you, right? It's like zero, one didn't exist, so you had to approximate it with other things. Um, this didn't exist either, but if you're curious why on Windows it's called backspace and delete is the thing that deletes forward, but on a Mac, delete is going backwards, and the thing that goes forward is called forward delete, is, I, should we get into this at all? Like, Windows basically just reused the name that didn't make sense anymore because backspace is not the space that goes backwards anymore. It stopped doing that 50 years ago. And then Apple tried to like, rename things in a better way, but did they really? I don't know. But now, you, like, if you look at the key, you can imagine this sort of 150 years of history erasing and, and, the, and the, the liquids and the lasers and, and the Plato and all of this stuff. And this, this key? I don't know, I, I, I just like to believe that it's just a proof that like, we've never not had fun with keyboards. And that's it, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. The quick, the first thing is, if you want to play with this typewriter that I showed you, this sort of simulator, uh, go there and you can like there's even exercises. It goes like way deeper than what we showed with colors and stuff. So, so it might be fun if you don't have a typewriter. Even if you do, it's like just easier. Um, and the second thing is a Tumblr. I don't own this, but it was done actually by Raquel Meyers, whom I mentioned, and another person. Um, and it's just like a gallery of all sorts of like art, ASCII, typewritten, whatever. So I, it goes back like a decade, and it's just a beautiful resource. If you want to just like learn more and be inspired, or just like sort of check out what did people do in this space. Um, but that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. Sorry, um, can you, you can all hear me. Um, yes, I can hear myself. Um, thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating and entertaining and just brilliant. We've had some fantastic comments online. Um, and randomly, this is a fact that I just remembered as the talk was going on, um, which I think is quite lovely. So the longest word that you can write with the top line of a keyboard is typewriter, which I think is a lovely fact. And you can probably thank QI for that fact. So, um, so I feel like it is true and not just urban legend that it, that is actually a thing. And also I did spend my early years as a five, six year old programming robots to dance like this <laughs> on basic and I had so much fun. So you just brought back a lot of memories, but thank you so much. Um, does anyone in the room have a question for Martin at all? If not, I will go to some online while you think of them. And if you don't have them, that's fine as well. Um, OK, let me go through. Um, Liz Fraser asked, um, she sort of said, this is amazing, but it makes me wonder how things have been collected, archived, preserved as successive computer technology becomes obsolete. Through your research, have you found that, I think she was referring to all the early art and things like that happening. Yeah, Can you... I mean, it's sort of similar how like a lot of those ephemera are. There are some institutions, like I used to volunteer at the Computer History Museum in, um, in, in Silicon Valley in California. Um, uh, there's some ephemera, I know there's some like printed examples of things, but, and I think there's like a big community of people who try to um, like use, like emulate, right? Like use your whatever computer you have to approximate the old computers. Um, not so much with Plato yet, unfortunately. The, the Plato that I know was in a Seattle museum that's now closed. So, yeah, kind of a hit and miss. But um, I think for typewritten art, 
uh, we've had a lot more luck, maybe just because it's like treated differently, maybe because it's actual art more often than not. I think with computers, it, 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 uh, I don't know, I, what's art anyway? So uh, I think there are some books that collect typewriter arts, uh, uh, typewriter art, uh, including I think some from actually publishing in the UK. I don't know of anything uh, with, um, with computers, but that's why I shared this Tumblr at the end because it's sort of like the closest I can think of to, I don't know where I'm supposed to be looking, by the way. Um, uh, the closest I can think of the sort of like the museum of the sort of efforts. So, but I'm not an archivist, so I actually, if anybody here knows how to preserve those things, they're, um, they're probably like people who would be excited to dive in. Absolutely, yeah, thank you. And another question online from Kat Hughes. Um, have you had a chance to play with an Olivetti golf ball typewriter? I remember using one, changing the balls to get different typefaces to create artwork for print and a local small magazine. Yeah, yeah, so I, that's gonna come up in a second. It's almost as if I, the red one, uh, uh, there's a Selectric uh, typewriter, which some of you might recognize, which was like the first one that introduced this sort of ball that you could swap fonts. And it was like the invention. And I think that eventually, here we go. Eventually, uh, this is way too fast. Um, uh, eventually, as their patents run out, other companies copied it. And I think Olivetti had one, Xerox had one, Remington had one. Um, and uh, what's kind of interesting, and I wish I had a slide for you, that obviously those balls, um, were you know, distributed by IBM Olivetti and they were like made out of metal and uh, you couldn't really like do anything with them, uh, especially since they had to be durable and, and pretty precise, honestly. But in like last year, somebody 3D printed um, a Comic Sans ball, um, which I don't know. I guess that's okay, I don't know. Um, but, and it worked. And so you can sort of imagine somebody actually printing semi-graphics from early computers and sort of like crossing the wires in those kind of ways. So yeah, this was the invention that like actually allowed people to swap fonts. And, and there was a huge thing for, uh, because you, you literally could like italicize a word. You still had to like swap it, uh, but it was so much easier than like literally having two typewriters uh, side by side. And uh, so that was kind of interesting. And I think there were some balls um, for like forms, so they had like kind of lines like we saw with the, the semi-graphics, but they're all business oriented. Great, thank you. And um, a lovely fact from Glenn, who is watching from the US, um, apparently unidentified emoji and other characters are called tofu because they often appear as a narrow box, a piece of tofu, which I just thought was quite interesting to share. Um, Anyway, there's um, a shout out to Glenn, who's also my editor for my book, uh, which is why I wanted to mention that. <laughs> um, does anyone in person have a question? Yes, I'll come around. Hi. Um, one of the things I remember in, from the days of the original Internet, when you had no graphics and only characters, was that there was a, a netiquette published by my provider which allowed you to not necessarily express emotions, but to emphasize things in, in different ways. One was that if you typed in capitals, you were shouting. And the other is if you want to emphasize a word, you put two asterisks in front of it and two asterisks behind it. Um, are there any things like that from the early days of typewriter, any sort of manuals that exist about the, the the politeness of using a typewriter as new technology? Oh, that's a really great question. Now I wish I had those. I mean, I do have them all here, but it would take me forever to find them in my database. But the, the early typewriter manuals are sort of really split into three pieces. And by early, I mean like late 19th century. It's like one, how to type on a typewriter. Two, how to fix your typewriter, because it was such a big thing. And then three was really basically like, how to behave in an office. Because type, like, the really reductive argument is offices happen because typewriters happen and because elevators happen, right? Those, the two technologies needed to happen for offices and bureaucracy and all of this kind of stuff. And as a matter of fact, you see much less bureaucracy in Japan um, in the early 20th century because typewriters arrived there much later because they were much more complicated. Um, but so yeah, there's all of this sort of etiquette about like how to address people and how to even behave. And I, you know, this is hard to talk about, but there's 
there's quite a lot of sexism as well and quite also like expectations that like women are there to like use to type and and don't speak and you know just like collect the thoughts of men and address there's like I have many booklets it's like how to be a secretary there's like it doesn't make any of us look good like just as humanity um uh, maybe a lot more than in the US but I think also in the UK but yeah, so this, I think this, this, uh, the typewriter was not just a typewriter, it was just sort of the beginning of a lot of other things that sort of it, either you could say it enabled and some people would claim, or it was just at the right place at the right time. But uh, yeah, I think there were, uh, Glenn actually, whom we just mentioned, he wrote this like beautiful article about like the tradition of capital letters for shouting. Uh, which actually kind of predates typewriters, but came back to typewriters. Um, uh, the one interesting thing that might interest people in this room, whom I, who I imagine you are all probably interested in type, typesetting, um, the, there's this strange tradition in typewriters of two spaces after the end of a sentence. And it's like a whole discussion or like, okay, boomer, like whatever, <laughs> like, you know, uh, you can sort of like see what age somebody is by the tradition. But, uh, uh, and, and there's also sort of like disagreements about like it's better or not. Um, but the interesting thing is that when typewriters came about, and you might have noticed this actually in some of the documents that I showed you in those slides, when typewriters came around, the books were typeset with more spaces after the end of a sentence. And then the books kind of abandoned it pretty quickly for whatever reason, I'm not a, a, an expert. But with typewriters, it sort of stuck around until pretty much the end of typewriters, even the beginning of computers. So um, the typewriters did nothing wrong here. It's just sort of like an accidental um, different timelines uh, not converging when they have to, which is also, by the way, why your keypad for your calculator, it goes the other way, then the keypad for your phone app. Just ask me some other time, it's a whole different story. But basically, that's here we go, it's like one of them. Um, that's another example of just sort of those things. Those things don't talk to each other, history just happens, right? And, and so, yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, I'll come around with the mic. I wish I plugged in like all of the keyboards because this would go on forever. It would be fun to watch. Oh, yeah. Um, this may or may not give you a chance to respond, but uh, the talk about uh, sort of office stuff has reminded me that I think 2023 is the hundredth birthday of the A4 paper format. So uh, I don't, I don't know if any parties have been arranged yet, but maybe we should kick something off. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to check our online. Community I don't have that. more That's questions. That's pretty cool. Maybe we'll have to have a talk about A4 paper. Actually, I've been thinking about that for a while. But anyway, um, we've had a question from Lan. What do you think of the persistence of the QWERTY layout? Oh my God! Yeah. That's a question. Um, a spicy question. Um, um, is it spicy? I don't know. It's a spicy topic for sure. So. Um, <laughs> I've researched a lot of this. It's like a whole chapter in my book about QWERTY and the sort of stories we know. And we don't know everything. That's the unfortunate part, right? Like the, the people who were creating QWERTY and the first type, the first typewriter that became the commercial typewriter that was a success, they were sort of operating like a startup. They didn't write a lot of things down. Writing things down would actually maybe slow them down or allow the competition to, you know, steal their secrets, I don't know. So we, we, have, we have a lot of hypotheses, and a lot of our good, a lot of our bad. Um, here's a few things that I learned that are like interesting. One is uh, that query was not made to slow you down, not at all. It was actually made to not slow you down very explicitly. Like the very goal of even the first typewriter was to transcribe Morse communication um, from you know naval or whatever communication. Uh, and it requires like 40, 50 words per, uh, per minute, I think. And so the typewriter had to be really fast. That was even before touch typing was invented, even before like all of these other things that we started using typewriters for, um, it was meant to not slow you down. And so it's sort of, uh, and the way we know this is that a couple of people um, actually did statistical analysis on the typewriter keyboard attached to the typewriter mechanism that existed today, which also changed over time. And they proved a few things, which is A, um, 
It was not, not an accident. It was made to not slow you down. Even the typewriter in the upper row was probably not an accident. It's, it's statistically not very likely that it was an accident. They actually did it on purpose, just maybe for demonstration purposes. Um, but, uh, you know, that's 150 years ago. Uh, when you look at like the history of typewriting, basically every five years somebody wants to invent QWERTY, and, and, and most famously August Dvorak in you know, 1930s, 1940s, has some really good ideas about like, how to make typewriting easier, and maybe it was, but the funny thing is that I think the, my argument is that QWERTY is kind of at least okay, it's good enough. It's sort of like not exciting to think about something that's good enough, but especially now that typing is not as professional as it used to be, right? We don't all sit down in a hard-to-use keyboard for 12 hours a day, uh, expected not to make any typos. We just sort of use it with our thumbs or whatever. Um, especially now, it's just good enough. And for people who can't use it or don't want to use it, there's all sorts of options that are better, ostensibly, maybe better for them. Um, but the query also has this sort of beautiful benefit of being the sort of universal standard. I, saw, I show you Japanese keyboards and Chinese keyboard. Every keyboard today you can use, it's basically QWERTY. And it's maybe depressing in a way because it's, um, it's sort of colonialism of, um, like, you know, it sort of became, it started in America. And there's all sorts of like early typewriters that try to do something else, a Thai typewriter, a Russian typewriter, and eventually they also come to QWERTY. But in a way it's also just kind of like, maybe by, partly by design, partly by luck, it just was, pretty good, and that there's something kind of cool about this, something interesting. And the other thing that maybe the last thing I wanted to mention that makes it really hard, we don't have control, like we cannot compare those things, right? There's no alternative, alternate timeline where Remington had fewer lawyers that would sue you if you talked badly about QWERTY, which they did, or they would uh, not put QWERTY typewriters in schools because that helped people embrace them. And it's hard to know if there was enough, right? If some other standard, there were other standards. There were people as early as QWERTY that tried to absorb QWERTY, including the guy who invented QWERTY. By the end of his life, he was so annoyed by QWERTY that he tried to do a different layout and he lost because QWERTY was so good or so something else. So I don't know, I don't feel like bad about QWERTY. I think it's like a fascinating story. Um, it's kind of interesting how people get emotional about it. Still, 150 years later, like try to do something to get people riled up 150 years after you invent it. That's pretty cool, I think. But so different ways to look at it, but I think it's a much more complicated story than just like a bad stuff that was random, made to slow people down that we got stuck with because we're, civilization sucks. I don't know, That's, it's much more complicated than that. I think civilization sucking is a great place to stop. Um, thank you so much. I think, feel, yeah, thank you, Martin. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. I'd just like to say on behalf of everyone online, they have enjoyed it as much as everyone in the room. If you are in the room and happen to be sat at the back or on a seat without one of these, we have got a first chapter or two chapters of Martin's book to give away. So there are a few spare copies hanging around if you don't have one. Um, so do take one if you'd like one. Um, I'd just like to thank you all so much for coming. Thank you again to Martin. That was absolutely fantastic. And if anyone wants to carry on the conversation, I think a few of us will be going to the Crown and Sugarloaf, which is just, um, just down the road about, if you can st throw a stone there. If you don't know the way, follow me or someone else who knows. But um, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you again. It's been fantastic. Cheers. Thank you.